So we're going to begin the lecture video, or this part of the lecture video, with the image of a sarcomere that I created, or a diagram of the sarcomere that I created. Uh, once again, this is available on Canvas, so please make sure you, that you print this. And I would like you to know the components of the sarcomere, as well as the protein composition of these components. So I'm not going to spend very much time pointing certain things out, because I think I have it clearly labeled. And of course, if you have any questions over any of this stuff, you can always send me an email. All right, so we're just going to quickly go over the sarcomere. I want to emphasize again that this is a relaxed sarcomere. So this is going to look a little different when the sarcomere is actually in a state of contraction. All right, so what defines the sarcomere is the Z-disc. So the Z-disc is made up of the protein alpha actinin. So we have Z-disc over here, and then we've got another Z-disc over here. So what defines the sarcomere is from Z-disc to Z-disc. All right, and then right in the middle of a relaxed sarcomere is, are the uh, thick filaments. So right here are your thick filaments, and the length of your thick filaments is your A-band. So I want to emphasize that the A-band, that remains constant. So that length never changes, um, no matter if the sarcomere is relaxed or if the sarcomere is contracted. Now anchored, to the Z-disc, at least one end of it, are the thin myofilaments. All right? So here are the various proteins that make up the thin filaments, which I am going to discuss in the next slide. So one end of the thin filaments is anchored to the Z-disc. Now, in addition to the thin filaments being anchored to the Z-disc, we also have this massive protein called Titan. So Titan is a spring-like protein. One end is also attached to the Z-disc, and it goes right through the thick filaments and anchors to the M-line. So that M-line is found right in the middle of the A-band, and the protein is myomesin. And then we have what's called the zone of overlap. So this is where the overlap between your thick filaments and your Thin, I'm sorry, the overlap between the thick filaments and the thin filaments. So this zone of overlap is very, very important. Literally, it's the overlap between the thick and the thin myofilaments. So especially important when we discuss muscle contraction. And uh, here we have the H zone. So the H zone is defined by one end of your thin myofilaments to the next, all right? And you'll see that the H zone will change in distance uh, when the muscle or when the sarcomere contracts. Uh, the last thing I just want to point out before we move on to the PowerPoints is the I band. So the I band represents the distance from the end of your thick myofilaments to the beginning of the next one, and that's your I band. So you can see right in the middle of the I band is your Z disc. And the I band, unlike the A band, will change in length, uh, depending upon whether or not the sarcomere is relaxed or contracted. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint presentation and pick up where we left off. And so now what we want to do is go over the protein composition of the thin myofilaments, and then we're going to follow that up by looking at the protein composition of your thick myofilaments. So remember that we could say, uh, we could refer to it as thin myofilaments, or we could keep it short and refer to it as thin filaments. Either way, it means the same thing. All right, so we have four proteins that make up your thin filaments. You have F-actin, or F stands for filamentous actin, which essentially is composed of G-actin, also called globular actin. So let's look at this picture down over here, right? So the way I want you to think of this is a pearl necklace, right? A pearl necklace. So the pearl, this round thing that you're seeing here, that's your globular actin. So globular or globular is because it's round. It's the shape of a globe, for example. So then when we take each individual globular or globular actin, and string them together, then we have filamentous actin. So if we relate this back to the pearl necklace analogy, imagine that each individual pearl is G-actin, and when they're all linked together, then we have filamentous actin. Well, it turns out that we have two strands of this filamentous actin, and you can see it over here. So we got one strand over here, 
and then we've got another strand over here. And they twist, or they're twisted about each other. And uh, so that's one part, or one protein, that makes up your thin filaments. The next protein is what's called nebulin. And nebulin is a long, non-elastic protein. And what this does is it binds, it's sort of like the glue that holds the two individual strands of F-actin together. So once again, if we relate this back to the pearl necklace analogy, imagine that you've got two pearl necklaces and they're glued together by nebulin. Okay? So without nebulin, then the F-actin, the two individual strands of F-actin will separate. So clearly we need it there. All right, and tropo tropomyosin is the next protein that we find associated with the thin filaments. Now, trop uh, tropomyosin is a double-stranded protein molecule, and so it takes on this rope-like structure. So what this is, ladies and gentlemen, is your tropomyosin, all right? So the arrow that I drew are the tropomyosin strands, and we have two of them. So we've got tropomyosin over here, and then we've got tropomyosin over here. Now, one thing I, I want to emphasize, this tropomyosin will cover what's called the myosin binding site, all right? So we're right over here. It'll cover the myosin binding site. Now, where exactly is this myosin binding site? Well, it turns out that if we look closely at G-actin, you'll notice this little yellow area. That yellow area, folks, is the myosin binding site. All right, so this yellow shaded area on this roundish shape G-actin is the myosin binding site, and very, very important. So this myosin binding site right now is being physically covered by tropomyosin, and I think you'll see this better when we look at the next slide. All right, then we have uh, the last protein called troponin. Now, troponin is made up of three subunits, which we're going to list in the next slide. So the troponin is right over here. So it sort of looks like a bird, right? And there are the three individual subunits. So we've got one over here, one over here, and one over here. So taken together, folks, all of this is troponin. And uh, so you'll see how calcium comes into play uh, and how important it is uh, leading up to muscle contraction. Now, before we leave this picture, I just want to point out nebulin. And nebulin is right over here, just in case you can't see it. So nebulin, once again, right over there, and I'm shading it in. And that essentially is what's going to keep the two uh, strands of F-actin together. All right, so let's now look at the next slide. And what I've done is I've created my own image because I couldn't find a decent one. So what you're looking at is essentially a cross section of your thin filaments, okay? So here is actin. Remember actin, uh, G-actin is uh, globular actin, and when they're all strung up together, then we have F-actin. So we have two strands of F-actin, and they're held together by this protein over here. So that protein, folks, is nebulin, right? So right there, that's nebulin, and I'm shading it in. All right, so if we look at actin, uh, we have this little pocket that I've colored in black. So this black rectangular box is on actin, so it's a little pocket, and that pocket is called the myosin binding site. Okay, so you'll see how this is all going to come together, or at least I hope it does, when we get there. All right, so here's your tropomyosin that's shaded in neon green, and you can see how the tropomyosin is sitting on that myosin binding site. It literally is blocking that myosin binding site. All right, so then we have our troponin complex. So I mentioned in the previous slide that it's made up of three separate proteins. So we have TNT. As one component, we have TNC, and we have TNI. So TNT is the uh, subunit of troponin that will specifically associate with tropomyosin, and that's what the T is for. So you can think of the T for the fact that this is the subunit of this troponin complex that will associate with tropomyosin. Very important. All right, now what about the TNC? 
So the TNC is the troponin subunit that will bind to calcium, right? So you can think of the C for calcium. So calcium will bind to TNC, one of the subunits of this complex, this troponin complex. Then finally, we have TNI, right? TNI. And this is the troponin subunit that will bind to actin. Now, I don't know why they left it as an I instead of an A. Personally, I would have thought it would have been better to just name it TNA, just so that we know that A stands for actin, but they didn't ask me. So uh, it's I, not A, right? So once again, this is the subunit of troponin that binds to actin. All right, so how does this all work? Well, what happens, folks, is when calcium becomes available, calcium will bind to TNC. Right, I just said that. So I'm gonna put calcium over here, and then over here we're gonna put calcium. So calcium will bind to TNC. And the result of this is a structural or conformational change, which is significant. So much so that once calcium binds to TNC, this entire troponin complex will move. And it will move in this direction, okay? As I've indicated with the arrow. And as this troponin complex moves, the tropomyosin that's associated with the TNT will move along with it. So none of these proteins will separate. They will remain together. All right, so the troponin complex has now shifted uh, upon the binding of calcium to TNC, which then moves the tropomyosin. So if you could visualize this, this whole thing now will shift this way. So remember, this is because of the binding of calcium. This will not happen unless calcium binds to TNC. So that's very, very important to keep in mind. Now, what about the bottom half over here? Well, because calcium has, uh, has attached to TNC, then we're also going to have a structural conformational change. So this entire thing will move in this direction, all right? So it's gonna shift this way. So if this all moves, then what is revealed? Well, what's revealed or what's exposed are these myosin binding sites. Because remember, if this whole thing shifts, the myosin binding site that's present on that actin is no longer being physically covered by tropomyosin. So now that the myosin binding site is now exposed upon the binding of calcium to TNC, the head of myosin will now freely bind to this binding site. And that's why it's called the myosin binding site, because that binding site is meant specifically for myosin. So we're going to talk about myosin in the next slide. So please make sure you understand this. If you have to play this video again to understand this diagram that I just did, please make sure you do that because otherwise it'll make you extremely confused when we actually get to the details of muscle contraction. So what we're doing here or what I'm doing is I'm giving you the pieces and then ultimately we're going to put everything together and hopefully this all makes sense. All right, so let's now look at myosin. Right? So myosin is the protein that makes up the thick myofilaments and we can keep it short and refer to it as thick filaments. All right, so the uh, myosin is made up of three parts. So we have, let me just draw the myosin, right? And uh, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. All right. So we have the head, right? So myosin is composed of the head, and then we have the hinge, and this hinge is flexible, sort of like a hinge on the door. All right, and then finally we have the tail. So the tail of myosin. So once again, we have the head, we have the hinge, and we have the tail. That's all part of myosin. Now, if we look at the head of the thick filaments carefully, what we're gonna see are two pockets, all right? Uh, we'll begin with this one over here that I'm shading in red. So on the head of myosin is what's called the actin binding site. So I hope it makes sense that the fact that it's called actin binding site means that that is the pocket in which actin will bind to. All right, the next structure that we find 
is the, and I'll shade this in blue, right, right there. All right, so the next pocket that we find on the head of myosin is the ATP binding site. And I'm going to go back to black. That's not coming out very well. So ATP binding site. So why is it called ATP binding site? Because, ladies and gentlemen, that is where ATP will bind to. Okay? All right. So before I uh, do another diagram, I just want to just look at the structure of the myosin or the thick filaments, just so uh, we're clear. So here is my M line, and of course, obviously, this is your thick filaments, your thick myofilaments, and there's act titan, right, titan going through the core. Now notice the heads of myosin, right? So on one side of the M line, all the myosin heads are pointing in this direction. And then if we look on the other side of the M line, then the myosin heads are facing this way. Okay, there's a reason why I am talking about this, because you'll, you'll see, or at least I hope you will. All right, so the heads of myosin pointing this direction as I drew, and then we have the heads of myosin pointing in this direction. All right, and so right now they're all in this reclined position. Now, why does this matter? Well, because this is going to look different when the muscle actually contracts. So let's diagram one more time. This time, we're going to look closer at the myosin, right? So I'm going to draw the myosin once again. I'm not going to bother drawing the components, the head, or I should say label the components of the myosins. I'm not going to bother draw, labeling the head, the hinge, and the tail because we just did that. All right, so, but what I will do, however, is make sure that I reiterate these pockets found in the head of myosin. So this area that I shaded in red, that's the actin binding site, which we just discussed in the previous slide. And then I'm going to change back to blue. And this right here is the ATP binding site, all right? So we've got these two binding sites, these pockets found on the head of myosin. All right. So we're going to say that the myosin right now is in a reclined position, okay? The more correct way is that it's cocked, right? And uh, it's nice and reclined. And this is when myosin is what's called in a high energy state. So it's in a high energy state. All right. Now, if we look at the ATP binding site, what we find is ADP and inorganic phosphate. Now, why do we have that? Because, as I said, this is the ATP binding site, all right? And this ATP binding site contains an enzyme called ATPase. So this is an enzyme. Its substrate is ATP. So what this enzyme will do is here's your ATP, and this enzyme will break down or will hydrolyze ATP. So we end up with ADP plus inorganic phosphate and energy, right? That's why we have ATP in the first place is because that's what ATP is for. It's a source of energy. All right, so remember that what we find in this ATP binding site is this built-in enzyme called ATPase. All right, so then, you will see later, and I'm leaving out details because, again, we're building it up, right? But I really, really need you to understand these parts that I'm, I'm leading you up to, and then eventually we'll see the big picture when we go through muscle contraction. All right. Now, let's redraw the heads of myosin now, or the myosin. We're going to draw myosin a little bit different. We're going to draw it in this sort of tilted forward position, and we're going to refer to this as pivot. So this now has pivoted forward, right? And this is why we have that hinge, because that hinge is flexible, and this is what's going to help move this myosin in its cock position, high energy state, or if it's uh, in this forward position or in this pivot position. Now, we're going to correctly call this power stroke, right? Power stroke. All right. And furthermore, we're going to label this low energy state. 
So this is the low energy state of myosin. All right, so how do we get there? Well, how we got there is ADP and PI leaves that ATP binding site. So let me just quickly shade everything again so we know what we're looking at here. All right, so the red is the, the active binding site and the blue is the ATP binding site. All right, so once it's pivoted forward, which we refer to as power stroke, once again, low energy state, here comes ATP, right? So ATP will bind to the binding site. After all, that's what it's for. All right, so this ATPase that's built in to this ATP binding site will immediately hydrolyze ATP. So boom, energy is released. And that energy is what's going to have this myosin go back to its high energy state, all right? So the analogy I like to give is sort of like a loaded mouse trap. So if you imagine, I'll try my best to draw one. As you can see, I'm not quite the illustrator that I wish I was. So here's your mouse trap, and uh, here's the cheese. I don't know if this is helping or making it more confusing. But anyway, here's the mouse trap, and here's the bar of the mouse trap, right? So what we needed to do in order to get this loaded, so to speak, and just waiting for the mouse to consume that cheese, is we had to use a little bit of energy. So imagine your fingers moving the bar of this mouse trap in this direction. So you want to think of this as the high energy state of my set. It's caught, all right? You needed energy to load this mouse trap. So then here comes the mouse. All right, so that's my little picture of a mouse. So the mouse eats that cheese, and immediately this bar will spring forward, right? So this is now going to move this direction, and that's the power stroke. So all that energy is now released. So that energy basically hits the mouse, and hopefully it dies quickly and humanely. But I hope that this analogy makes sense. So if we want to go back to loading the mousetrap, guess what we need to provide? We need to provide energy. And this is why ATP is there. So when ATP binds to the binding site, it is immediately hydrolyzed by ATPase. And energy is liberated. And it is that energy that will allow the myosin to go back to its cocked high energy state.